I think I have kind of an easier job than some people because this is a sector where we, we've seen a lot of progress in the last couple of years. We've learned an awful lot. But I will want to leave you with the message is that our progress has been very much tip of the iceberg. There's an awful lot more we could and should be achieving. And in fact, I, even though we haven't succeeded as much as we have, I still have this thing, especially listening to the last couple of sessions, that the challenges to delivering energy efficiency aren't as great or as complex in some sectors. There's plenty of challenges, and we'll talk about that. But really, if we can't do energy efficiency, we're kind of a bit buggered when it comes to advanced uh, renewables and uh, agriculture and a few other things. So it really behoves us to start with the easy stuff, even if it's all relative in this business. Um, energy efficiency is all about theory versus practice. And, and I'll return to that theme a few times. In theory, energy efficiency offers the cheapest, easiest, most immediately available carbon savings to a very large amount of carbon savings. And yet, in practice, we don't seem to be getting that out of the system. We don't seem to be achieving what we could. In theory, it should be driving everything we do in energy policy, given that it, 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 you know, the economics are strong, the, the policy drivers are strong. In practice, policy still tends to focus a little on the supply side, a little more on electricity than other dimensions. In theory, the economics of energy efficiency are wonderfully beautiful. But in practice, we don't see delivery rates, we don't see activity rates in the market that should reflect that. So a lot of what we do in energy efficiency in SEAI and in government as a whole is trying to bridge that gap between what we think should be happening and what looks good on paper versus what happens when you get out there into somebody's attic or somebody's boiler room and you try and actually make it happen on the ground. And in that regard, it's great that we have two real practitioners of, of energy efficiency on the panel with me who can actually explain why my beautiful theories don't actually work when you get out there in the real world. The opportunity for um, energy efficiency is very considerable as a driver of emissions reduction in non-ETS, which makes it very interesting to us in the policy world. It really it represents a significant proportion, particularly of the energy-related emissions. Uh, just a point I want to make on this is that if you think about carbon reduction, say, in transport, and you think about the, 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 the long-term perspective, the 2050 goals we have, most of the technologies that will deliver the transport reductions haven't barely been imagined yet, and the cars that are involved and the vehicles certainly won't be built for some decades. With buildings, most of the buildings that have to deliver us, let's say, an 80 to 90 percent carbon reduction between now and 2050 exist right now. So we're talking about transforming an asset base and an infrastructure base that's already in place. And that creates quite a different dynamic to the policy items that are on the table and the kind of work we have to do. And that's why, without apology, I'm going to focus today on, the, on what we broadly call retrofit. I'm not going to talk too much about building new buildings. We can get into that if anybody has any particular dimensions they want to talk about. But I'm going to focus on the challenge of getting carbon and energy out of buildings and industry and things like that that are already mostly built. One thing I want you to take home from today, and I literally will have you take it home because I'll send it to you. The, the, the shady bits here are the curve you tend to see uh, that we produced about three years ago about the marginal abatement cost curve for Ireland looking at 2030. The shady bits are oil at $60 a barrel, so let's forget about that. Please, when I send it to you, start using the $120 curve, which is the white bits on this one. That's where we are, that's where, where we're gonna remain. So, and Neil will remember the, the debates when we produce these curves that actually some people thought we were silly using a baseline as high as $60. And it was quite a, fi a fight to get people to talk about $120. And now look where we are today, look where we're going. One of the interesting things about the shift in the curve when you go from $60 oil, and I'm saying $60 oil price is like, you know, an equivalent in gas price assumed. When you go from 60 to 120, the amount of abatement opportunity that comes at no or negative cost, i.e. it saves more than it, than it actually costs to do it over its lifetime, raises from about 10 million tons to about 16 million tons, just by changing the oil price. And that's even before you get into some of the technological developments over here on the right that have happened in the last couple of years that, that will, will merit further updating of these curves. And of course, a lot of it goes on in the non-ETS sector, which again remains interesting for its own reasons. Focusing on buildings a bit, in broad terms, this curve identifies about 9 million tonnes of carbon equivalent savings by 2030. Uh, looking at the uh, $120 curve, you can see how much of it comes at the negative or low cost. And ne let's talk about one of our theories versus practice things, because I know some of the economists in the room will, will challenge some of the assumptions about what an abatement cost curve does. And you can raise things like transaction costs and discount rates. That's all true, but I really don't think transaction costs 
uh, change a, a 200, a minus 200 figure into a positive figure. And I think, what, because we're talking about energy saving here, we're talking about investing in better light bulbs, better boilers, all that kind of thing, and they pay over a number of years, and, and they ultimately, in the most cases, pay more than they cost in the first place. And I think when we talk about the, the focus on the carbon price as a driver, if if, if energy prices as they stand now don't seem to be driving people to the huge amounts of untapped uh, efficiency potential uh, that are out there in the market, I don't think adding 10 or 20 euros to the, to the ton of carbon dioxide is going to flip that. There's something deeper going on. There's a theory versus practice dimension here between what economic theory says should be the return versus what happens in the real world due to what you call it market failure, market barriers whatever else, and, and we'll, we'll explore some of that. Because really, what we're talking about in energy efficiency is economically positive investment that's not happening out there. And when I talk about economically positive investment, and I'll, I'll give some examples later, but we regularly see every day of the week an, an industrial site turning down a project with a three-year payback because they don't have the money. So in other words, somebody is saying, I've got an investment with a guaranteed rate of 33% per annum over 10 years, so I'm going to make all that money out of it, but I can't seem to raise the money right now to do it. That's the kind of market failure we're talking about when we talk about energy efficiency. And that's the fundamental problem we're facing here. It is quite different to some other sectors for that reason. Now, what's driving us to actually get something done on energy efficiency? In the short term, we're talking, as in this decade, we're talking about better energy, the national program for uh, reducing energy and hence emissions in buildings, uh, domestic and non-domestic. A lot of activity there at the moment. Our goal is to upgrade, let's say, about a million buildings, domestic and non-domestic, between now and the end of the decade. If we do that, it'll knock about th three and a half million tonnes per annum out of our CO2 inventory, just uh, to that efficiency. And it'll save about six billion euros over its lifetime, more than it costs. This, so we're not talking about X euros a tonne in terms of, of cost or burden or penalty. We're talking about an investment that might co cost of the order, yes, of up to maybe 10 billion euros, public and private, to deliver those savings. But the lifetime savings will be more of the order of 16 billion euros. So there's a, an economic gain to that. Lots of jobs. I say 5,000 to 10,000, but I think that's a bit small, really. That's how many are out there at the moment, at the scale we're at now. But the, the potential for more jobs in retrofit is really very substantial indeed. That's the people now, men and women, going into attics to, to insulate them, insulating walls, all that kind of thing. But I'm not counting, for instance, the fact that, that we have worked with uh, businesses in the last three years that employ over 200,000 people and they've collectively reduced their energy bills by 300 million euros. So I think some of those 200,000 jobs are a little bit safer there than they were a couple of years ago. And I'm not counting the export potential of this. So there's opportunities all over the world for people who are ahead of the curve on retrofit, on energy efficiency and some of the technologies. In two weeks from now, we have a conference uh, gathering people from 45 countries around the world coming to Ireland to see what Ireland is doing in advanced energy management in industry. We really have a global reputation in that sector and there's a massive opportunity for construction firms, technology firms, energy and environment consultants to be exporting their, their expertise and their knowledge all around the world and I think the potential for this sector is very substantial. There's more happening than some of you might think. While always prefacing by saying we should be doing an awful lot more, but last year in the Irish economy a quarter of a billion euros was spent upgrading buildings from an energy perspective. And I think in the current economic climate, that's a pretty substantial amount of money going out there. That was driven by government grants, and I'll talk a bit about the role of grants in a minute. But over the last three or four years, uh, supports administered by us but paid for by you, the taxpayer, have upgraded about 200,000 homes in, in various programs and in various sectors of the economy and things like that. They typically have a payback of five to eight years. Some stuff is cheap and pays quickly. Some stuff is deeper and takes longer. And broadly speaking, every euro government spends on better energy homes saves Irish society five euros, ultimately, in terms of the energy gains, the environmental gains, the employment gains, things like that. Why aren't we doing more? Well, a big problem here, which I'll come back to, is it costs money, you know. So this, this, at the moment, we use grants as a driver, to, I almost think by proxy, to overcome some of the market barriers. If I, if I just use the, the non-domestic example at the moment, if, if, if I see, a, a, let's say, a I don't know, let's say a, a large hotel that, that has a project, they spend a couple of hundred thousand a year on energy. They have a project that if they invested in a new heating system, it would pay for itself in three years and continue paying for itself for another five or ten years and, and reduce the energy costs of that hotel very significantly. Right now they struggle to make the investment and then they have other concerns about, am I the first to do this and will the technology work, will the returns, all that kind of stuff. 
we give a certain amount of grants into that sector and we reduce the cost by a certain amount. But I don't think us moving a payback from, let's say, three years to 2.7 years takes us over some fundamental hurdle. I think it must be largely to do with the fact that we we're providing a kind of a state certification, if you like. We're standing over the project and saying, it's very, we think it's a good project. We're helping them find the right kind of contractors and the right kind of advisors. So all of those non-market dimensions are as important as the grant itself, which makes the grants sometimes seem an expensive way to do it. Because what I'm saying is, is there another way of doing that that actually doesn't involve quite so much capital on, on behalf of the Exchequer? And that's exactly the debate we're having at the moment. Can we, can we drive the market to the extent of growth that we have seen very substantial growth in the last couple of years, but can we do that on a basis that where the Exchequer doesn't pay the cost? Because ultimately, we are talking about economically very sound investments. And in those cases, one has to question what is the role of, of state investment uh, at the large scales it's at at the moment. That's 2020. If you look at 2050, there's absolutely no reason, and I don't think anyone should dispute this, but if you do, let me know and, and we can talk about it. But there's no reason why uh, our residential sector can't be 90% decarbonized by 2050. First of all, any building built today should be pretty close to carbon neutral, and I'd be asking your architect why not, because the technologies are all pretty mature, it doesn't cost a lot of the building stage, and you're building a building that's going to last for some decades. So really, I think there's very little excuse not to be building very close to carbon neutrality right now, and, and therefore zero energy. Funny, the rump of 10% in, when you get to 90% is actually nearly all water heating, because that's the one thing that so far you can't actually uh, defy the laws of physics uh, around, whereas you can insulate and, and design building fabric and, and, and passive solar and all that kind of thing to any degree because there's plenty of energy out there for you to capture and, and hang on to. Ultimately, if you want to get water warm in your home, you're going to have to put energy into it. And that becomes interesting from a point of view of things like electrification, solar heating on, on roofs, lots of things where we have to start looking at other, other ways of doing it. I, I focused a bit on the... Uh, domestic sector, I do want to say that just taking as an example, last year we gave out grants of 11 million euros to the non-domestic sector. 85 projects in every sector, that was literally, we were in VECs, we were in a couple of hospitals, we were in supermarkets, we were in power stations, all kinds of places. Uh, the savings to society from 11 million euros in grants is 11 million euros this year. The grants we gave it last year are saving society the same amount this year. The payback is about four years on that investment. So in other words, we gave it 11 million, the organizations we worked with put in another 40 million. So the total spend on this sector was 50 million euros last year, uh, pays for itself in five years, generating 10, 12 million euros a year. Tip of the iceberg, we, were f we had, I don't know, quadruply subscribed, is that, it? can I say that? We had four times as many <laughs> project uh, requests for funding as we could afford last year. The other three quarters are sitting there, hopefully some of them got done, clearly some of them didn't get done. If you're one of those, come back to us this year because we've just launched this year's fund. And again, we're seeing very strong interest in the commercial and public sector from people realizing there's plenty of low-hanging fruit in terms of energy savings in the non-domestic sector. And I'm focusing today because it's our, 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 that's the theme on carbon and energy type savings. But we're trying to become more sophisticated on what we really mean by least cost, because even if you have some challenges back there and then in the marginal abatement cost curves, you know, are there all the costs truly measured and all that? We're actually much better at measuring the costs than we are at the benefits, which remains a challenge, because there's a whole heap of benefits that we barely uh, understand how to measure. What are the health benefits of taking a quarter of a million households out of fuel poverty, which should be one of our main uh, focuses at the moment? What are the educational benefits from people living in more comfortable and healthier environments in their homes? What are the employment benefits? How do you measure a reduced dependency on imported fossil fuels from the fact that we're actually using less fossil fuels? You know, all of those things are difficult to quantify, and sometimes you end up with a kind of a skewed pitch then where, where you can put the costs very, very clearly up front. You can't measure all the benefits. And if we want to truly make the best policy decisions, and even if our driver is least cost decision making, we better make sure we're properly measuring all the costs and all the benefits so we can make the most informed decision making. Now, that's the prize, so how do we make it happen? Theory versus practice. If you ask people, I, I'm going to just use the example of homes here just by, by way of proxy. The issues are much the same in, in, in the other sectors. Um, 
you ask people why do you invest in your home or why would you think about investing in your home in terms of upgrading your insulation or your heating system and things like that, people tend to mention a number of factors and energy saving gets mentioned, comfort, some people mention environment, things like that. But really, when you delve into that in detailed research, which I won't go into the details of, but maybe you can trust me on it, what drives most people is the tangible benefit of comfort and health. It's about looking after my family, giving them a healthy environment, feeling comfortable in my surroundings. There's a certain degree of understanding that I will save money, but you can imagine that's less tangible. Particularly, let's say, if you're using oil to heat your home, it's quite hard to get a grasp on, I've just upgraded my home, and maybe then for, for the truck will come in October as opposed to September. And, you know, it's quite intangible. The really tangible bit is the comfort benefit in terms of the house feeling warmer literally the day the guys leave from doing the work. Environment does get mentioned, but in a way, when you look into the research, in a, in a way that people say, oh, yes, by the way, there's environmental benefit, but very few people upgrade their homes to make an environmental contribution per se. Other things are driving it, there is a dimension there, but it, it remains a weaker motivator for most people than maybe it will need to be in the future if we want to drive the kind of level of investment. And I should also acknowledge that the, the, the couple of hundred thousand homes we, we've achieved success in are relatively light retrofits. So the, the people spending maybe three or four thousand euros get, capturing the low-hanging fruit, but really not doing the kind of deep retrofits we need them to do if we want to decarbonize that sector by 2050. And that means we will need to move beyond, let's say, the, the simple positive NPVs. When you want to decarbonize a house that exists by 90%, you don't get a five-year payback. And you, so you've got to, start, got to start moving into different equations, different motivators, and, and things like that. So looking to where we need to go then, right now, as I said, we're driven by grants. Grants are very powerful, and they do, as I said, I want to make that clear, they return much more benefit to the state than they cost, well, to the society, anyway. Um, and uh, that, so they're not bad value at a societal level, but they are expensive in a time when capital is constrained. And you do need to think about, given that I don't believe most of the motivation comes from the check per se, but actually all the wrapping around it, is there a way of achieving at least most of that motivation or some of that motivation without such a heavy cost of the exchequer? Having said that, when you look at the cost of meeting our carbon mitigation targets in other sectors, the money we spend is actually pretty small uh, as a value return compared to some of the other things we might be facing if we want to achieve carbon tar targets, targets this decade and beyond. So we are looking at moving into more, more financial dimensions, and pay as you save is, is the most beautiful example of theory versus practice on the planet. You can explain it in one <coughs> sentence, try and get into the second sentence, and you'll be here for some days. And I, I will just point out that we're very committed to it because I understand what it can achieve, but nobody in the world has come close to achieving a pay-as-you-save model at any scale yet. A couple of trials in the, in the States with a couple of hundred homes, some have gone well, some have gone badly. In the UK right now, 70 full-time civil servants are working to design pay-as-you-save. Sarah's got slightly fewer than that on her team. They've been at it for about three years. They are, get, it's getting harder and more complex, and one recent paper issued by DEC itself said that we could expect up to a 97% fall-off in retrofit activity when we transition into the Green Deal next year. So that's the practice. So if we want to do it here, we've got to do it right. And for me, that means an absolute focus on the consumer and on behavior. So forget about the, the, the financial models and the institutional stuff. If you can create a system where people want to borrow money to, to upgrade their homes and the five-year payback, the money will flow. What you've got to f design is something that people will actually participate in. And the fact that it looks beautiful on a spreadsheet and on a graph, and, and you, if you just could sit down with a homeowner and explain the MAC curve to them, isn't exactly going to get a million people to sign up to investing in kind of 10-year loan models or, you know, 10,000 euro upgrades in their homes. So we've got to focus on designing something that people actually want to buy. The other major change is the role of the utilities. And most of the major utilities have now signed voluntary agreements with ourselves to work on their energy efficiency obligations in a collaborative manner. That's got huge power. They've got brand value. They've got market reach. They've got a lot of intelligence. They've got a lot of good ideas. So leveraging the power of the utilities out there, and I don't just mean the big ones. We're also working with the oil companies, the solid fuel companies, the whole range of them, I think that's going to be a major step forward in how we actually deliver this on the ground. We've got to get to scale. Even if we do a million homes, we can achieve this decade's targets without too much difficulty at the rate we're going. A little bit of uplift, uh, make sure we have some models in place. But if you want to get to the scale where you're really retrofitting all buildings of all kinds over the coming decades, we've got to take a couple of step uh, changes up. Finance is at the core of that, and, and the scale of finance involved in that is kind of scary. But scale actually makes finance more interesting. One of the big things at the moment now, you could probably get convinced a pension fund to invent, in, invest in retrofit because it's a 10-year low-risk 
risk, reasonable return kind of model, but they don't want to invest in something that's 100 million or 200 million. They say, you know, come to me when you're talking about billions. And that's where pay as you save has to kind of build mass and scale, maybe act as an intermediary for connecting large, long-term finance with small little, lots of little projects. Direct provision, they had this model that a lot of countries uh, talk about where you kind of industrialize retrofit. It's going on in Austria at the moment, and I think there's something about moving from each consumer doing its bit to some kind of mass scale. And I think there are models like, say, some of the work the GAA is doing on community retrofit that I think are quite interesting. You take it from a consumer proposition to something a little bit different. However, I just can't quite picture a truck heading down a street, spraying external wall insulation stuff both sides of it as it does terrace by terrace. I think industrialization still, still has a lot of social barriers in terms of how you actually involve people in that, how you sign everybody on a street or in a community up to something to get those kind of economies of scale and the benefits from doing it at a large scale. So I think there's a role for the carrot and the stick here. And I think you look at that in the UK where you now talk about maybe you can't at the moment, the thing is you can't build a sunroom without upgrading your, your attic, and I think you know, that makes sense in theory. In practice, I don't know how exactly that's going to be enforced and, and, and whether people will, will buy into it or not. Um, there is something about, for instance, would you link, you know, would, would you link your BEO rating to a property tax, for instance, or something like that? But I didn't suggest that. Somebody, somebody else down the back suggested that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and just, you know, so driving people in to give it more than just saying, assume, let's not assume everyone wants to do the right thing, or let's not assume everyone sees the economics the way we do. There's definitely a, a role for nudges and other things like that to try and make people do things uh, that we see as societally good, but right now people aren't doing. And I just want to end by saying don't neglect the behavioural dimension. The MAC curves don't include behaviour change. They don't, so they'll include people shifting to biofuel buses or electric vehicles, but they don't include people not driving so much or switching from the car to the bicycle or something, because both economists and engineers and sometimes policy makers are kind of bad at the people stuff. They're kind of bad at how do I convince people to actually turn their lights off instead of talking about get, putting new light bulbs in or how do I talk about them shifting mode in transport or whatever else. And also it's kind of open-ended because really the saving opportunity for modal shift is effectively everything. If we could get everyone onto the bicycle, then, we, then nobody's driving their car. So it becomes quite a hard thing to measure and a hard thing to enact. But particularly when we're talking about energy use in buildings, we're talking about me switching on my heating, we're talking about this building, we're talking about hospitals, schools. It's all about behaviour. And if we neglect that, we're not going to achieve anything. People are at the heart of using energy in buildings, and surely that's where the solution lies. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.